This weekend, we coordinated a new Serve King and Giovanni Impeci Petty card who took Basel by storm. I'll explain why I believe the 6'8 Frenchman has the best serve in the sport right now. Also, my fellow 22 year olds, Jack Draper and Chin Wen Jang, also took home 500 tournaments. I'll highlight their triumphs before previewing the final 1000 tournament of the season, the Paris Indoor Masters. And Yannick Sinner once again had tennis Twitter in a bit of a frenzy after making some interesting comments about his earnings. Hey, I'm Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. If you haven't yet already, make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more Christian court report updates like these. Francis Giovanni Impeci Petty card made history on Sunday when he toppled Ben Shelton to win the biggest title of his career at the Swiss Indoors Basel. Impeci Petty card beat the six seeded Shelton 6476 to become the lowest ranked champion in the tournament's history as he was ranked 50th at the time of winning the title. The six foot eight Frenchman powered down 109 aces in his five matches played this past week and he did not get broken his serve once, only facing three break points the entire tournament. Giovanni now beat Ben in their previous meeting from Queens in the summer leading up to this one. He won that match in straight sets, but I still felt that Ben was the favorite because he had more experience winning a 500 title before and I thought that he was overall in better form leading up to this championship. This match really just came down to a couple of points. First, when Ben got broken at one all, that was pretty much a wrap for set number one. And that game was very sloppy from Shelton. He hit a lot of bizarre unforced errors on balls that he really should have hit clean winners off of. This game showed that nerves might have been a big factor here for Ben as he was the favorite in this match as I mentioned earlier still and he had already done the hard work of beating the likes of top seed Rublev and then Arthur Feast in the semifinals. Ben did not have a single breakpoint opportunity in this match but there were times where he got it to 30 all but Giovanni just dashed the Americans hopes with massive serves. Shelton is normally a better server than his opponents but Giovanni low-key made him look mediocre. Shelton still held his own behind his serve, only getting broken that one time in the opening set. Mpechi Pettikart, though, did deserve to win this match because overall, he kind of did return better than Ben as well. He consistently had more looks thanks to him redlining at times and just overpowering Shelton with big returns and ground strokes. Still, Shelton is stronger from the ground whenever the rally is extended, so that helped him remain at least on serve until the breaker. Talking about the breaker, things were nip and tuck until for all when Shelton made the final fatal error of this match and fumbling a pretty easy put away volley to surrender the mini break. Shelton didn't get his racket on the ball for the remainder of the match as Impeccio Pettikard fired down two more aces to seal the biggest title of his career. Giovanni has had one of the biggest rankings rises on the men's tour this year. The freshman started the year ranked 205 in the world and he won a few challenges to get his ranking a bit higher. He made his first big splash on the main tour when he won his maiden title at home in Lyon own on the red dirt as a wild card. Giovanni kept that momentum going soon after making his first slam second week at Wimbledon. However, Giovanni struggled after SW19 as he lost his last eight of nine matches heading into Basel. Now he leaves with a new career high of 31 in the world and he puts himself in a great position to be seated for the Australian Open. Obviously, the big standout shot for Giovanni is his serve. He is six foot eight slash six foot nine, so that already gives him a massive advantage. He hits his spots just so well on his serve too, and it's just an effortless motion. So his form is hard to break down. It's very easy to replicate for him time after time. Giovanni clearly disguises his serve well too, because a lot of times players just could not read it well at all. He goes for it big on the second serve too, as his average second serve speed in this final was 100. 132 miles per hour and that serve i'm showing y'all now is 138 mile per hour second serve which is insane 138 miles per hour by the way was giovanni's first serve speed average in this final i think that Gio honestly has the best serve on the tour right now in tennis giovanni is the undisputed ace king right now as he has averaged 18.6 aces per match in the past 52 weeks which is nearly five more than second places hubert hercoc however giovanni also has the third highest double fault rate per match right now on tour with 5.1 but considering his high ace count and how much he goes for that second serve that is not too bad Giovanni is 
also technically the best server on tour right now after Bonzo, thanks to his higher ace count and hold rate, as of course he did not lose serve all week. Giovanni rose to number six in the all time ATP service leaderboard stats, but John Isner is still top dog as the American average. 18.7 aces per match and only 2.3 double faults. Isner also held nearly 92% of the time that he stepped up to the baseline. But Mpeci Pedicard already being top 10 server of all time, number six, despite only being 21 years old, is quite something. And he only has room to improve. Although you could say too, that as Giovanni rises and starts to face tougher competition, then his service success might not be as high too. I think it'll be a tough feat for Mpeci Pedicard to eclipse Isner's numbers though. Giovanni will still need to have a higher second serve points one percentage and have a higher number percentage of service games one, a greater hold percentage. Some of that is due to the double faults, but Giovanni doesn't quite seem to have the best rally tolerance either, which can leave him vulnerable whenever his opponents do get the ball back in the court. Still, I think it's not far-fetched to say that Giovanni is this generation's John Isner. Giovanni is more of a bigger ball striker though compared to Isner and he has more firepower from the ground, especially on that forehand which is one of the most dangerous on tour. Giovanni's single-handed backhand is definitely a glaring weakness in his game, and the same for Isner. Isner's backhand was also kind of a, a biggest weakness for him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Giovanni's first title came on the clay at Lyon. I think that him being French and playing on the clay more as a junior will help him a lot in having more success on the clay, where you'd assume that Giovanni wouldn't have the best results due to the clay kind of neutralizing the serve a bit more. Mpeci Pedicard is also a better athlete than Isner by far. He is a better mover, which is crazy, especially considering that he's once again six foot eight, six foot nine. Now, a few people have said that Giovanni is a little bit boring to watch because, you know, you could argue that he is quote unquote a serve bot. Now, I am not the biggest fan of serve botting, but I do believe that Mpeci Pedicard is more interesting to watch than Isner or Nopelka because of that athleticism factor and also the flashiness that the Frenchman incorporates from the ground. Those things are going to set him apart from a John Isner or a Riley Opelka. I also believe that Giovanni will have a better career than those two, both Isner and Opelka, when it's all said and done. And I believe that if he cleans up his ground game a bit more and strength, strengthens up that backhand, he can win a slam in the future. Wimbledon will probably be his best bet, to be honest. Let me know in the comments if y'all agree that Giovanni will be better than Isner overall when it's all said and done, and if he can win a slam eventually in his career. Now, talking a little bit about Ben Shelton, I do feel for the American because this is now his third consecutive tournament where he has lost to the eventual champion as he lost to Feast in Tokyo and then Yannick Center in Shanghai. He has come so close yet so far to lifting up the title. And as I mentioned earlier, I believe he struggled with nerves in this final in Basel. But playing a big server like Giovanni is tough because you know that if you make one little mistake, it can cost you the entire match. And it definitely did here. I think Ben will learn from his disappointments. And I think that it'll only fuel him to come back stronger, especially next year. And I think that next year will be big for him and racking up more big titles. Speaking of talented young lefties, Jack Draper won his biggest career title when he took down Karen Hatchinoff 6-4, 7-5 to claim the Erster Bank Open. Draper made things a bit more complicated for himself in this match as he led Hatchinoff by a set and four love before the Russian wrote off five consecutive games to come within points of leveling the affair. Jack though did well to keep his nerve and he regained control to seal the hour and 35 minute final to become the first man to win Vienna on his debut since his countryman Andy Murray did it 10 years ago. The 22-year-old Draper also now rises to a career-high ranking of 15 in the world. I said at the start of the year that 2024 would be the year of Jack Draper having his big breakthrough season, and it definitely has been for him. He won his first title in Stuttgart in the summer, made his first slam semifinal in New York at the U.S. Open, and now he has his maiden 500 crown. Now, Miles David of Tune Into Tennis posed an interesting question, and that's whether Jack Draper can emerge and become a true, consistent threat to the likes of Center and Alcaraz, and I say yes. That US Open semifinal with Yannick was tight in those opening two sets, and Jack came close to taking at least one of them. Draper's head-to-head -head with Yannick is tied at one apiece, and the Brit did claim a win over Alcaraz this summer in Queens.
screens. I think Jack has the game, the weapons, and the athleticism to definitely match those two, but the biggest question for me would be whether he can remain healthy enough to do so consistently. I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one, but what do y'all think? Will Jack eventually be in the conversation alongside Sinner and Alcaraz as far as being this generation's crop of great players? While on the topic of Vienna, I do need to mention Dominic Team, who played his last official professional match, falling to Luca Dardari in the opening round, 7-6-6-2. The 31-year-old team was clearly past his prime, being ranked outside the top 300 by the time of his retirement. Just a few years ago, he was one of the best players on the tour, and when he won the US Open in 2020, we thought that it'd be the first of multiple slam titles for the Austrian. But unfortunately, that 2021 summer wrist injury was essentially career-ending as Domi was never the same since then. It is very sad that this happened to team because the sport would be even better if Domi was still at the top of his game, especially challenging the likes of Alcaraz and center, but it just was not meant to be. At least he can always call himself a Grand Slam champion. Now, talking about the women now, Chen Wen Jiang claimed her fifth WTA title and third of the year when she won the Tokyo 500 after defeating Sofia Kennan 7-6-6-3 in the final. The top-seeded Jiang wasn't broken at all in this final and was really impressive though to me is Jiang's 360 in form since losing in the first round at Wimbledon this year. Since those championships, Jang won three titles, the Palermo 250, immediately followed by the Olympics gold in Paris, and now this Tokyo title. She also reached the finals in Wuhan, the semifinals in Beijing, and the quarterfinals at the US Open. Jang did start her season well, making the finals of the Australian Open, but she struggled with form and going deep in big tournaments soon after that. Now Zhang is back to her career high of number 7 in the world and is set to play her maiden WTA finals. Shinwin has won 28 of her last 32 matches and this strong second half of her 2024 season has definitely made me respect her even more and I think that it's proved that she can be a slam champion very soon. I know Iga has a choke hold on this slam right now but I think Roland Garros might be Shinwin's best bet although I think that the Chinese woman can make it happen at any of the four slams. By the way too, props to Kedden on her run to the finals and it's good to see her back on championship Sunday playing good tennis. And our final title winner from this past week is Serbia's Olga Danilovic, who dominated American qualifier Caroline Dolahide 6-3, 6-1 in the Guangzhou Open Final. This is Danilovic's second career title and her first in six years. Looking ahead to this coming week, the big tournament is the Paris Masters, where all the big stars except for Novak Djokovic will be in action. This is the last big tournament before the ATP Finals in Turin, so the final four spots will likely be finalized here. So far, Yannick Sinner, Carlos Alcaraz, Alexander Zverev, and Danu Medvedev have qualified. Taylor Fritz is next in line at number 5, so he'll likely make the cut too. Novak's behind him at number 6, but the Serb and two-time defending champion isn't in action in Paris, so we might not even see him in touring. Kasper Ruud, who has lost his last 7 of 9 matches, is still in a decent spot to qualify again. So is Andre Rublev, and Alex Diamonor might qualify too, especially if Novak doesn't end up playing. Now, going over the Paris draw, Yannick Sinner, the top seed, could face Ben Shelton in the second round, followed by Hogarune in the third. Sinner could play Taylor Fritz in the quarterfinal for a rematch of the U.S. Open final, but Taylor will have to play either Jack Draper or Yuri Lehechka in the opening round, which will be very tough. And then two, Alex Dimonor is also in this section. Next, Alexander Zverev could open against Talon Greek Spore yet again. Then in the third round, Zverev could face Lorenzo Musetti for the second consecutive tournament as Musetti knocked him out in Vienna this past week week. Home favorite Arthur Fisto is there as well, and he faces Marin Cilic in the opening round. Down below, Andre Rublev is on course to face Stefano Tsitsipas in the third round, as both men have great draws. Looking down at the bottom half, Dino Medvedev has one of the tougher draws for sure. The 2020 champion has a difficult opener in either Alexei Popperin or Matteo Berrettini. He could then face Francis Tiafo in the third round, but big foe faces Gio the Giant, Giovanni and Petri Pettigard, in the opening round, which is probably the biggest popcorn match of this tournament, first round popcorn match. You also can't overlook Karen Hatchinoff too, who has been on fire this indoor swing. Up top is Grigor Dimitrov, although I think the Bulgarian might be sent packing by Thomas Makac for the second consecutive week. I'm not that confident in Herkosh going on a deep run here as he hasn't shown signs of being 
truly healthy since that one with an injury. And then finally, Carlos Alcaraz will likely play Ugo Umber in the third round, but Ugo does have a rather tough opening round against American Brandon Nakashima. I'm almost kind of certain that Carlitos would play Tommy Paul in the quarterfinals should the Spaniard make it that far because I have absolutely no confidence right now in Casper Ruud. Given my predictions, I have Sinner and Rublev in the semifinal followed by Makach and Alcaraz. I know Makach, he beat Alcaraz in the Shanghai quarterfinals, but I would have Alcaraz getting revenge here if they did face off here. And then in the finals, I have Rublev taking the upset over Sinner to face Alcaraz in the final, and then I have Alcaraz taking the title. I picked Rublev over Sinner because I just think that something has got to give. Like, Yannick can't win US Open, Shanghai, and Paris Masters. I mean, he obviously could, but I think, you know, enough is enough. Someone else has got to win a big title now, too. Now, Sinner was also a big topic of discussion this past weekend after being asked by Eurosport how it felt to walk home with the $7.5 million he earned from the inaugural Six King Slam event in Saudi Arabia. Sinner's win over Alcaraz in the final got him a record six million dollars in prize money plus the 1.5 million dollars in appearance fee however yannick said he doesn't play for the money rather he traveled to the middle east for the tough competition 10 days ago you won the most lucrative match in the history in riyadh what is it to go back home put your luggage down and say okay guys i made just six million dollars which is we're off we can go on vacation for two years if you want <laughs> no it's um i I don't play for money. Uh, it's it's very simple. I am, of course, it's a nice price and everything, but you know, it's it's for me. You know, I I went there because they were the um, possibly the six best players in the world, and then then you can measure yourself with them. And it was also a nice event for me. It was the first time that I went to Riyadh. It was was something very nice, and. Uh, of, of course, you know, when you come back as a winner for me, it was more that, okay, um, I played the matches in the right way and then this hopefully can improve me as a player for also for the future. And, you know, I think that's that's it. Then, of course, you know, the the money is, is, is important, but n not that much. I live a good life also without this, this money. So, you know, I think it's much more important the health I have and then, you know, surrounding myself with great people and the family I have and then the money, it's, it's just an extra. Many people were not buying this, including Stanislas Wawrinka, who put a now deleted laughing emoji tweet in the replies to this video. Of course, Stan was not the only person who felt that this was cap, as a vast majority of tennis fans believed that money was pretty much the sole motivating factor for Stanner to play this event, and I kind of have to agree. To me, the tennis season is already long and grueling, and Stanner has won a lot, so he's played a lot over 70 matches in fact the exhibition did not offer any rankings points so money was the main incentive for these guys to go and play this match i'm not buying that aspect of center wanting to play tough competition because he just played Djokovic in the shanghai final and alcaraz in the beijing final generally i don't think yannick plays tennis for the money just for the love of the sport i believe the money i believe is a bonus to him but he definitely played this exhibition because of the prize pot let's be real that was a very pr answer from center because i'm sure that yannick didn't not want to come across as money hungry or greedy but his comments might have backfired because a few people felt that this was disingenuous to be honest it might have been best for Yannick to just say oh yeah I love having six million dollars extra in my pocket but he still could have faced backlash from that as I could see people calling him greedy and money hungry aside from his core fan base Yannick just is not that popular within the tennis community right now not only is he winning everything but of course many people are still not happy about that whole doping case and they're still skeptical skeptical about that that is all for this Christian's court report and let me know in the comments if you believe that Giovanni and Petri Pedicard will go down as one of the best servers in tennis of all time. And again, can Draper threaten his fellow young guns Alcaraz and Sinner consistently for big titles? Give your own predictions too of who you believe will take the title in Paris and then make sure you subscribe again and click the notification bell so you are notified whenever I post updates throughout this tournament. Thank you all so much again for watching and for your support and I'll see you all next time here on Christian's Court.